God has spoken. The word of God has been written. But we have a problem. The Old Testament and New Testament were written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. As generations passed, the ability to read and write these three languages faded from prominence. How do we teach the Holy Scriptures when the ability to understand these scriptures is frustrated by the inability to read and write the languages of the autographs? The answer is simple. Translate the Holy Scriptures into the native language of the people being evangelized. The first attempt at translation was the oral Targums, portions of the Pentateuch that were translated from Hebrew into Aramaic. But these works were incomplete and marginal. The first complete translation of the Old Testament was the Greek Septuagint. There is no way to truly calculate the impact the Septuagint had on the ministry of Jesus Christ and the outreach of the first century church. There is no doubt that Jesus used portions of the Septuagint to communicate the Holy Scriptures. The apostles also used the Septuagint extensively, while the early church fathers used the Greek Septuagint to teach the truths of the New Testament. With the success of the Greek Septuagint and the Greek New Testament, why would other translations be needed? The answer is simple. More and more converts entered the early church that couldn't read or write Greek. To follow the path that leads to our present-day Bible, we must explore the path of translation. In the book of Acts, the disciples were first called Christians in the city of Antioch of Syria. During this period of history, Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. The native tongue of this city was Syriac, a dialect of Aramaic. The population of this city was a mixed ethnic population that used Greek as a secondary language. The further away from Antioch a person traveled into the rural countryside, Greek was less likely to be found. For the Syrian church, this issue created a problem. The Greek Gospels and the Pauline Epistles were found predominantly in the major metropolitan areas where Greek was understood. The need became obvious that the Greek New Testament needed to be translated into the native language of the Syrian people. Toward the beginning of the third century, parts of the New Testament began to circulate in Syria. These circulating manuscripts became known as the Old Syriac Version. Only two manuscripts of this version have survived from antiquity. The Syrian church produced a harmony of the four Gospels called the Ditesseron, compiled by Tatian, a native of Assyria. This work was written in Syriac and published in Rome in 170 AD, and it became the source reference for a large portion of the Christian community for several centuries. Toward the end of the fourth century, the Syrian church produced a complete translation of the Old Testament and New Testament in their native language. 
this translation was known as the Peshitta version. The interesting difference between this translation and other later translations is the fact that the Peshitta version contains only 22 books in the New Testament, not the authorized 27 books. The Syrian church did not accept as canonical the four general epistles of 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, and Jude, and the book of Revelation. The Peshitta translation is the official Bible of the Syrian Christian church today, and still these five books are not part of their official liturgy. When the original manuscripts of the New Testament were penned, the dominant language throughout the Roman Empire was Greek. But this would not always be the case. By the mid-third century, Latin began to replace Greek as the dominant language of the empire. This was especially true of the Church of Rome. The divine scriptures were initially to be read to the people in Greek, but translated to the congregants by the priest into Latin. This dual reading of the New Testament from Greek into Latin eventually started the process of written translations of the Bible into Latin. By the close of the fourth century, every priest who thought he knew Greek produced his own unique Latin version of the New Testament. So many Latin manuscripts were in circulation that the early Western Church was in a state of confusion. The confusion caused by these circulating individualistic translations caused Augustine, the great Bishop of Hippo, to lament. He wrote, those who translate the scriptures from Hebrew into Greek can be counted, but the Latin translators are out of all number. The confusion reached such a level that Pope Demaeus in 383 AD urged Jerome, the great doctor of the church, to produce an official Latin translation of the New Testament. Pope Demaeus did not want Jerome to consult the original texts, but to assimilate, compile, and edit the various Latin versions already in circulation. This restriction caused Jerome much concern that his first inclination was to say, no thank you, to the Pope. Two factors finally caused Jerome to relent and accept the Pope's commission. First, he agreed to the work in obedience to the wishes of the Pope. And second, Jerome wanted to put an end to the confusion caused by so many poorly translated New Testament manuscripts. When Jerome set his mind to the project, within one year, he finished his translation of the Gospels. In subsequent letters to the Pope, Jerome stated that he only altered the existing Latin texts when it was absolutely necessary to retain continuity with the original Greek text. By 405 AD, Jerome published a complete translation of the Old Testament and the New Testament. His monumentous work was finished. But the influence of this translation had just begun. For the next 1,000 years, Jerome's Latin translation 
was the authorized Bible of the Western Roman Church. The impact Jerome's translation had on the history of Christianity is without question. Both the Catholic and Protestant branches of Christianity were allowed to grow and mature because of this Bible. The third great Bible translation can be found among the Coptic churches of North Africa and Ethiopia. The Coptic churches had a greater impact on the doctrines and traditions that comprise our Christian faith today than history has recorded. In some regards, the Coptic church was the think tank of the early Christian church. Much of our orthodoxy and Christology, including the doctrine of the Trinity, can be traced to our early church fathers of the Coptic Church. Some of the oldest surviving manuscripts of the New Testament we have today are of Coptic origin. One of the greatest collections of Coptic manuscripts can be found in the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin, Ireland. Other ancient translations that came from the early church are For nearly 1,000 years, the authorized religious text was the Latin Vulgate. Latin was considered the religious language of the Western branch of the Christian Church. During the 1,000-year period in Western European history, known as the Dark Ages, knowledge was power and Rome controlled the knowledge. The uneducated peasantry understood only the portions of the Bible provided to them by the priests and scholars of the era. The Roman papacy used knowledge of the Bible as a means to control the ignorant population. During the latter days of the Dark Ages, the Roman papacy developed extreme theology in order to support its political ambitions for control over the monarchies of Europe. Extreme interpretations of the Bible were used to provide legal basis for the papal power grab. Dissent arose and questions were asked. Is the Pope the vicar of Christ on earth? Does the Roman Pope have all spiritual and temporal power on earth? Must all kings and peasants bend the knee to the Pope? As long as the Bible remained in Latin, the balance of power remained with Rome. A break with Rome was needed in order for the people of Europe to breathe the air of freedom. The Bible must be wrestled from Rome by translating it into the vernacular of the common people. John Wycliffe, who was known as the Morning Star of the Reformation, became an outspoken critic of the Pope who called for a renewed nationalism free from papal interference. Wycliffe's one driving passion was to see the Bible translated into the English language 
in order to take the knowledge of the Bible out of the hands of the clergy fraternity. He strongly believed that the Bible was the sole authority for all situations in the ecclesial and secular world, and he believed the laity could understand the Bible if presented in their own language. He wrote, Christ and his apostles taught the people in the language best known to them. It is certain that the truth of the Christian faith becomes more evident the more faith itself is known. Therefore, the doctrine should not only be in Latin, but in the vulgar tongue. And, as the faith of the church is contained in the scriptures, the more these are known in a truer sense, the better. The laity ought to understand the faith, and, as doctrines of our faith are in scripture, believers should have the scriptures in a language which they fully understand. John Wycliffe and his fellow scholars began the arduous task of translating the entire Bible from the Latin Vulgate into the Midland English dialect in 1378. The first version of the Wycliffe Bible was published in 1382, while the second publication occurred in 1388. The Wycliffe Bible was warmly received by the English-speaking people, but the Roman papacy considered this Bible a threat to their political control. Rome instituted persecution and inquisition against all English people who were influenced by Wycliffe's Bible. All manuscripts that were found were burned while the translators were subject to inquisition. Large numbers of the Wycliffe political group known as the Lollards were burned at the stake. Only a few copies of the Wycliffe Bible have survived from these burning days. In 1450, all things would change with the invention of the removable type printing press by Johannes Gutenberg. It would be hard to control knowledge when it was easy to mass produce the Bible. The next great Bible in the English language came from the hands of William Tyndall who was driven by the desire to translate the Bible into the English language and distribute it. Because of the ban against English translations of the Bible, Tyndall sailed to Germany in 1524, and he never returned to England. In Hamburg, he worked on the New Testament, which was ready for printing the following year, and he secured a printer in Worms. 6,000 copies were printed, but only two have survived to present day. Tyndall planned to complete the translation of the Old Testament. However, after completing his work on the Pentateuch, Tyndall was betrayed by a fellow Englishman named Henry Phillips in 1535. While in Antwerp, Phillips arranged an ambush of Tyndall, and he was imprisoned for one and a half years. In the end, Tyndall was strangled and burned at the stake in Brussels on October 6, 1536. His last words were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. English authorities banned Tyndall's translation and attempted to destroy 
every copy they could find. But they did not find them all. Even though the first completed printed edition of the Bible in English was accomplished by Miles Coverdale, it is largely accepted to be the work of Tyndall. History has recorded that William Tyndall is justly called the father of the English Bible. Following the work of Tyndall, other editions soon surfaced. We see the Matthews Bible in 1537, the Taverner's Bible in 1539, the Great Bible also in 1539, and the Edmund Beck's Bible in 1549. The bloody persecution fostered by the Catholic Mary I, Queen of England, also known as Bloody Mary, frustrated the publication of the English Bible to the point that it was virtually impossible to work on any further publications. Most of the Protestant English scholars fled England to Switzerland to escape the murderous intentions of Bloody Mary and they gathered in Geneva. During the early years of the Protestant Reformation, Geneva was seen as the Protestant Rome, the heart of Protestantism in Europe. The Geneva English Bible was first published in 1557, and it was widely received by the Protestant English Church. But the Geneva Bible is not without its controversy. The basic translation was good, but the published Bible was filled with copious amounts of marginal notes that reflected the theological, ecclesial, social, and political opinions of the more liberal elements of the Protestant Church. Needless to say, the Geneva Bible was rejected by Catholic Rome and the bishopric of the Church of England. The marginal notes challenged the political authority of the Pope and the religious system of the Anglican Church. The Geneva Bible needed a response and the Church of England took up the challenge under royal authority. The popularity of the Geneva Bible caused problems for the Church of England and the royal throne. The Calvinistic marginal notes challenged the authority of the established church supported by the throne. In 1564, Matthew Parker, Archbishop of Canterbury, initiated the work to publish another Bible that would replace the Geneva Bible. The process took nearly four years, with the first publication of the Bishop's Bible being in 1568. The actual translation of the Bishop's Bible was mediocre at best because of the sloppy editorial oversight. Needless to say, the Bishop's Bible had marginal notes favorable to the ecclesial structure of the Anglican Church and the throne of England, but antagonistic to the Puritans and the Geneva Bible. In spite of the defects of the Bishop's Bible, it became the only authorized Bible that could be used in public worship. A conflict is coming. The cauldron is boiling with two competing Bibles, each antagonistic to the other. England was troubled 
with two competing translations of the Bible. The Geneva Bible, loved by the Puritans and the common populace, was a 1560 translation based on the works of William Tyndall. But the translation was seen as too Calvinistic. The second translation was the Bishop's Bible that was authorized for church worship by the Anglican bishopry, but disliked by the Puritans and common people. England needed one translation that both churches and individuals would accept. In 1607, King James I appointed 50 scholars to work on this translation. Even though these men used the best available Hebrew and Greek manuscripts, they closely followed the two previous translations. This version became known as the King James Version of the Bible. King James had a personal interest in this translation project because he considered the Geneva Bible the worst translation possible due to the Calvinistic marginal notes found in the Bible. James made it clear that the Bishop's Bible was to be the foundation of this new translation, but he ordered nearly all marginal notes removed. The completed work was first published in 1611 and was known as the Authorized Version, and the phrase King James Version first appeared in print in 1884. Even though the title page of the Authorized Version says that it is a Bible newly translated out of the original tongues, this is not totally accurate. Even though the translators used the best available Hebrew, Greek, and Latin texts, the Authorized Version is simply a reworked version of the Bishop's Bible with nearly all Episcopalian and Calvinistic marginal notes excluded. The Authorized Version met with marginal success and acceptance among both Episcopalian and Puritan factions. But eventually, the King James Version supplanted all other English Bibles. The King James Version of the Bible is still read and in publication today. For the next 250 years, the English Bible rested from repeated translations. The authorized King James Version set on the top of the Bible heap as sole authority, the king of the mountain. The translators of the King James Version primarily used the Bishop's Bible and Textus Receptus as compiled by Erasmus and other 16th century scholars to produce the Bible. Textus Receptus was a compiled list of manuscripts emanating from the Byzantine Empire in the 7th century. For the translators of the King James Version of the Bible, Textus Receptus was the best source documents available. But this would change with the discoveries of Codex Alexandrius in 1621, Codex Vaticanus in 1819 in the Royal Library of Paris, and Codex Sinaiticus, discovered by Count Zinzendorf in 1859 at the Monastery of St. Catherine on Mount Sinai. All three of these Unical manuscripts date closer to the original autographs than Textus Receptus, therefore were considered more reliable.
The discovery of these three manuscripts caused the King James Bible to be compared to these older documents. The KJV was found wanting. Toward the end of the 19th century, by comparing the KJV to the new codexes, it became apparent that the King James Version of the Bible contained the accumulated errors of 15 centuries of scribal transmission. A new translation was needed based upon these newly discovered codexes. The translation work began in England on October 4th in 1872 with the assistance of several American scholars and the New Testament was published in May 17th of 1881 and the Old Testament was published in 1885. This work became known as the English Revised Version. In 1901, the American delegation issued the American Standard Version of the Bible. The American Standard Version made several changes from the English Revised Version. The American Standard Version substituted Jehovah for Lord, and they used God where the Tetragrammaton occurred in the Hebrew text. The Americans also changed Holy Ghost to Holy Spirit. They also substituted Shalom for the grave, the pit, and hell, where the committee deemed the change was needed for scriptural clarity. The English Revised Version had a poor showing in England. Complaints surfaced immediately upon its release. The English style used by the translators did not set well with the general public. Charles Spurgeon, the great English evangelist, made the following statement concerning the revised New Testament. The revision was strong in Greek, but weak in English. During the 20th century, academia turned a more critical eye toward the prevailing English translations because more and more handwritten Greek manuscripts were found that predated Textus Receptus. Discrepancies were being found that challenged the traditional Bible. Painfully to say, that one of the more glaring examples of our traditional understanding of the New Testament can be found in our beloved portrayal of Jesus Christ with the adulterous woman found in John chapter 7 verse 53 through John chapter 8 verse 11. The earliest and most reliable manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have these verses. If these verses cannot be found in the most reliable manuscripts, then how did they get into our Bible? Some Bible historians believe that this beloved story migrated into the Gospel of John around the 7th century. Initially, it is believed this story began as a record of an actual historical event that was not included in the gospel, but was remembered as a marginal note. This marginal note slowly migrated into the Gospel of John. Another example of document inconsistency can be found in the closing verses of Mark's Gospel. The most reliable early manuscripts do not have Mark chapter 16, 9 through 20. It is believed that a scribe in the second century added this longer ending to Mark in order to create a link between the Gospels 
and the book of Acts that chronicle the snake-biting incident with the Apostle Paul. Interpollutions, like the closing verses of Mark, can have deadly consequences. James Coots, pastor of Full Gospel Tabernacle in Jesus' Name, Pentecostal Church in Middlesboro, Kentucky, died from a snake bite on February 15th of 2014. Coots was the star of the reality TV show called Snake Salvation, produced by the National Geographic Channel. Coots Pentecostal Congregation was a snake-handling church who adamantly believed in the snake-handling verses in the Gospel of Mark. Why am I addressing these issues now? These discrepancies were identified during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and Bible societies felt the need to address some of these issues. Even though we still find these references in the more modern translations, we also find marginal notes such as this. The most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark chapter 16 verses 9 through 20. In order to explain these discrepancies, Bible societies began their work in order to provide more accurate translations. The latter half of the 20th century saw several different versions released to the public. We see the Revised Standard Version published in 1952 and the Catholic publication of the Jerusalem Bible in 1966. The New English Bible was published in 1970 and the New American Standard Version was published in 1971. Several of these publications met with harsh criticism that these Bibles were too liberal in theology and politics. In some regards, it was the Geneva Bible controversy rising from the grave. The Synod of the Christian Reformed Church and the National Association of Evangelicals united in an effort to produce one translation acceptable to all Protestant denominations. The project began in earnest in 1968, with the entire Bible being published in 1978. The publicity that followed this publication stressed the interdenominational and international emphasis of the work. Because of this emphasis, this work became known as the New International Version of the Bible. It took time, but the New International Version of the Bible slowly replaced the King James Version in public worship and personal family settings. Today, the New International Version is the Bible of choice among Protestant denominations. Another aspect of the English Bible came about when it was perceived that the Bible was too complicated to read. The basic English Bible was published in 1949, while the Good News Bible was published in 1976. Reader's Digest also got into the act with its own edited edition of the Bible in 1982. The last, simplified, paraphrased version of the Bible is called The Message that was published between 1993 and 2000. 
these simplified, paraphrased versions of the Bible did not seek to distort the truth of Scripture, but in many cases, the easy reading style lost the truth of the word in English rhetoric. These publications did have a positive side in that they did lead novice readers to more precise translations. These publications did not attempt to deceive the public, but other Bible publications intentionally sought to confuse and deceive the Christian community in order to prove their theological and political positions. The New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures is a translation of the Bible published by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society in 1961. It is used and distributed by the Jehovah Witnesses. The New World Translation is an inaccurate and misleading and heavily biased Bible that strongly supports the doctrines of the Watchtower Society. This translation is worded in such a way that it virtually strips Jesus of his deity and position with God the Father while regulating Jesus to a position of a lesser God in relation with God the Father. It is obvious that the Watchtower Society commissioned non-biblical linguists because they refuse to identify their translators. The New World Translation is clearly a deceptive work designed to support the heretical teachings of the Jehovah Witnesses. In 2011, the New International Version became the source of controversy when a new edition of the Bible was published that was gender neutral. The editors changed all masculine references such as he, his, and brother or sister to person, someone, they or them. Even when the original autographs reference father, they changed the word to parent. They changed son to child and brother to fellow believer. There is no doubt this Bible is a distortion of the original manuscripts and the correct translations that should be used. But why would the publishers of the NIV do such a thing? The answer is simple. Politics. The editors wanted to appease a feminist element and appear to be politically correct. The truth lost out to politics. Another edition of the Bible that distorts the truth of Scripture came from the gay rights political group. This version is known as the Gay Bible or the Queen James Version of the Bible. The Queen James Bible was published in 2012 and is based on the 1769 edition of the King James Bible. The editors sought to remove all negative references to homosexuality from their Bible. Therefore, they edited the eight verses in the Old and New Testament that call homosexuality an abomination in order to be friendly to the homosexual community. Again, the truth of Scripture is distorted in order to appease a special interest group.
in the evolution of the Bible, we now have reached a point that truth and accuracy are not as important as political correctness. Should we not like the Bible calling our actions sin, then we publish a new Bible removing the sin. In some regards, the changes are subtle and deceptive. We must use care in regards to the Bible we use as the foundation of our faith. Is the Bible the Word of God? Can we trust the history recorded in the Bible? One question is easier to answer than the other. The history of the Bible is being validated with each new archaeological digging season. Archaeologists who subscribe to the minimalist theory doubted the existence of King David for several decades. but. The discoveries of the Tel Dan Stella, the palace of King David in Jerusalem, and the carved pillar near Bethlehem have challenged their doubt with scientific evidence. Is the Bible history? I believe it is, and the evidence supports my conviction. The second question is harder to answer. Is the Bible the Word of God? To millions of Christians, the answer is yes. But again, it comes down to faith. By faith, I believe the Bible is historically accurate and it is the Word of God. Every person must consider the historical Jesus presented in the four Gospels of the New Testament. So, the questions I presented to my young traveling companion in Episode 1 are just as relevant now as they have been throughout history. Did Jesus really exist? Did He perform the miracles noted in these four Gospels? Did Jesus rise from the dead? The New Testament demands an answer.